Welcome to part 6 of our refutation to the Unitarian. Now, let us continue with the subject. Now, as I already mentioned um, in the previous video, Hebrews 9.14 makes it clear that the Spirit is eternal. And it is the sp and I would like to make it clear here that it is the Spirit of God who directs us to Jesus Christ and allows us the grace to follow him. Now on to the next point, which the Unitarian brings up. Quote, Yahweh says, study the scripture, hold fast to that which is good. Remember the day of judgment is going to be a one-on-one -on -one situation. Let's pray we choose the right one. Those who believe and teach the Trinity doctrine will have to face the same judgment as everyone else. Unquote. Now all stand before the judgment seat of Christ to be judged for the good and evil that is done. Now the next point. Quote, what then is the Holy Spirit? In John 15, 26, we read that the Spirit comes from Yahweh, and in this verse, it comes to us as proof of the Creator. When Yeshua was baptized in Matthew 3, 16, we see the Ruach HaKodesh, or the Holy Spirit, cut again coming from Yahweh, this time in the form of, an, of a dove, which anointed Yeshua, with, with the Holy Spirit and with power, and he used it to do good, healing all that were oppressed, and Yahweh was with him. The Holy Spirit is Yahweh's power, the power he sent out from himself to do his work. As Ephesians 4.30 says, Grieve not the Holy Spirit of Yahweh, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. The Holy Spirit is no great mystical figure, some calling it the set-apart ghost. We are introduced to Yahweh's Spirit in Genesis 1-2, and the Spirit of Yahweh moved upon the face of the waters, unquote. Now, the next point I'll say is this. The Holy Spirit isn't merely power. He is a person, too, as I've mentioned before. I also want to mention something briefly which I didn't touch upon about the Spirit being sent which I think is vital to remember. And I want to quote the following passages from John 14, 23 to 27 and John 16, 7 to 15. Let us read the following. John 14, 23 to 27. Quote, Jesus replied, anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My father will love them and we will come to them and make our home with them. Anyone who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own, they belong to the Father who sent me. All this I have spoken while still with you, but the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things, will remind you of everything I have said to you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not be afraid. Unquote. John 16, 7-15 Quote, but very truly I tell you, it is for your good that I am going away. Unless I go away, the Advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him, send him to you. When he comes, he will con prove the world to be in the wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment about sin, because people do not believe in me about righteousness, because I am going to the Father, where you can see me no longer, and about judgment, because the prince of this world stands condemned. I have much more to say to you, more than you can bear, now bear. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all the truth. He will not speak on his own. He will only speak what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. He will glorify me, because it is from me that he will receive what he will make known to you. All that belongs to the Father is mine. That is why I said the spirit will receive from me what he will make known to you. Unquote. Bear in mind, John 14.28 is in the same context as these verses. Notice that the Son says that he and the Father will make their dwellings with the believers by the Spirit. Not to mention, Jesus also says in verse 12 to 14 of chapter 14, quote, Very truly I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works that I've been doing, and they'll do even greater works than these, because I'm going to the Father, and I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask me anything in my name and I will do it. Unquote. Now even though some Bibles do not contain ask me but say ask instead, Jesus still says he will do it within the given context. In John 15, 16, the Father also gives, the, gives to the believer. Quote, you did not choose me but I chose you and appointed you so that you may, might go and bear fruit. Fruit that will last, 
and whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you, unquote. Both contexts demonstrate that the Father and the Son can be invoked and give what is requested from them. We know how the Father does, but the only way Jesus can grant us our requests, not to just one person, but to multiple people at the same time, is if he's omnipresent, an attribute that belongs only to God. In the context of John 14 to 16, the Holy Spirit, or the Spirit of Truth, certainly functions as a divine person who is sent by the Father and Jesus himself. Why? Jesus himself identifies the Spirit as a divine person, not as a mere shield or sword or anything remotely like that, as I have stated before. The book of Acts clearly has the Holy Spirit speaking and acting as a person. As for coming from the Father, no problem. The Nicene Creed is consistent with this as is scripture ultimately. Remember, sola scriptura. Scripture is our ultimate rule of faith. Regarding Ephesians 4.30, grieving the Holy Spirit, even in that context, still indicates that the person, is, the Spirit is a person. You can't grieve a force or a mere power. As for Genesis 1, generally you can argue that it's talking about the Trinity, including let us make man in our image in verse 26. Although Tertullian uses this verse for the Trinity, I prefer not to. However, in light of the context of Scripture, I wouldn't dismiss what Tertullian has said as implausible. I shall continue my refutation in the next part.